It's question show time. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my channel, question pops into your brain, uh, write it down. I will gather them up and I will answer them here. Um, it's kind of dark right now, so it's probably gonna get darker and darker as the day goes on. Uh, so anyway, it should be probably black behind me by the time we finish. All right, let's get into the questions. Gray. Hey Fraser, what's your take on the best uses of the moon? Well, as an astronomer, I hate the moon. So, so if we could just get rid of the moon, that would be fine. Um, but I think you're probably talking about it from a space exploration point of view. So, um, uh, right. So, this, I mean, the moon is less useful than I think people think. Um, off the top of my head, right? Like, it's not a great place to live, right? The radiation environment, the lack of oxygen, the lack of plants, the lack of water. It's a terrible place. The low gravity. Earth is better. Um, but what the moon has going for it is it is mostly out of our gravity well and uh but it has a lighter gravity well on its own but it also has some resources on it so so if you want to take stuff out into the solar system uh you can bring them up from the moon but the problem of course is like mining stuff on the moon is going to be really really tough uh, because again no air radiation lower gravity Etc. Um, and it still does have like a 2.6 kilometer per second um, escape velocity. So it's not nothing. It's not free to get off the moon. You still have to pay a lot. Um, so I think though, but it is this stepping stone. And I, I, I know, uh, I forget, was it Carl Sagan? Someone said that like it's, we're so fortunate that we have the moon as this, it's like this perfect stepping stone out into space. So I think the moon will serve as that stepping stone, either as a place where our space stations will orbit and then we will acquire some resources. There's probably large reserves of water on the moon that we can access at the poles. And of course, water is going to be rocket fuel. So there will be some resources that we're going to be able to use on the surface of the moon. Um, it's going to be a great place for just doing research about learning about the moon. And of course, the moon has taught us a lot about the earth. So I think there's, there's real value in having a crude space station on the moon where astronauts will go and, you know, gather samples and do research and send them back home to earth. Although, you know, does it make more sense to just make robots do that? So I know a lot of people talk about like helium three. Yes, there is vast reserves of helium three in the regolith of the moon. But the problem is like, we don't know how to make fusion work here on earth yet in the sort of most perfect environment. So um, to go to the moon when it's gonna cost us hundreds of thousands of kilograms to just get anything to the moon. Um, so, and then we don't even know how to use the helium three yet. So maybe in the far, far future. So. I actually don't think there's a lot of great uses for the moon. Tourism, maybe? Um, so I think it's, it'll, be, it'll act like a stepping stone for us to go from out farther into space. And I hope that we use it. I hope that we do take those steps and then move ourselves out into space. But in terms of like, what's the most useful thing out there? It's asteroids, right? Asteroids is the raw material that we want to use to make our future solar system spanning civilization. Gravity wells are for suckers. Don't go in them. Add A. Who's Fraser Kane? Why is Fraser telling me what is and isn't going to happen? Is Fraser qualified? Where does Fraser get his information? Why are people asking Fraser questions? Who am I, right? I'm just some rando YouTuber. And uh, who knows if you can trust or believe me. So uh, here are my qualifications. Um, I am the publisher of Universe Today, which is a space and astronomy news website. So, uh, and I have been doing this job. I've been publishing space news for about 20 years now. I started in 1999. Yeah, so I'm a little more than, more than 20 years now. Um, I've also been the co-host of the Astronomy Cast podcast with Dr. Pamela Gay for 12 years. Um, I don't have a degree in astronomy or astrophysics or rocket engineering or rocket surgery or any of that. Um, my, my diploma, I only have a diploma in computer science. I went to engineering at the University of British Columbia, but I failed out in the first year. So, uh, so my qualifications are I have been reporting on space and astronomy discoveries for 20 years. 
and that's how I've learned what I've learned. I've had a chance to interview probably thousands of astronomers and space researchers, either on the various podcasts that I've done or just as part of the articles. I've probably written 20,000 articles on Universe Today across all kinds of different discoveries, and each time I have to do fact-checking and talk to the researchers. And I'm friends with enough astronomers and PhD scientists and and uh, researchers in the field that they would tell me that I'm wrong and often do if I ever get it wrong. So, um, and I also understand what my limits are. Uh, you know, some questions are beyond my pay grade. Others, I'm happy to tackle. Uh, so, you know, what are my qualifications? Just doing the job for 20 years. And you can decide if you want to believe me or not. Vivek Sharma. Now we all know that black holes bend light, so there may be some black hole out there perfectly placed in such a way that light from Earth reaches it and gets bent due to gravity and instead of falling inside the black hole, just as a half rotation of black hole and shoots out behind the Earth like a tangent. And then it's possible to see how the Earth was millions of years back, considering we have a great telescope. Yeah, that's like guaranteed that when you look at a black hole from any angle, you are seeing the light that is emitted from you that is going around the event horizon of the black hole and being emitted in the opposite direction. In fact, that gives black holes part of their, their shape. And there's a great video by Veritasium where he sort of shows you what the different layers that you see of the black hole and sort of leading up to those first images of the supermassive black hole at the heart of M87. And I'll put a link to that in, in the show notes because it's because it's such a great, it sort of shows you what, what each piece. And there's one layer um, where light is going around the black hole and, and coming back. Now, of course, the problem is the number of photons is so small. So when you said you need a great telescope, you need a ridiculously great telescope. You need the perfect telescope that can see every single photon and turn that into an image. And the reality is that we will never have a telescope that powerful to be able to do that. But it's a great idea, a great thought process. And maybe if you're closer, then maybe you could start to see something, but then you wouldn't want to be that close because then you'd be getting torn apart. So, uh, but it's a great thing to think about. Bogdan Bratis. It might be a basic answer, but I cannot understand how certain objects like the moon can drift further away from another object in space. If gravity brings things together, why is the moon getting farther away? Are there other moons doing that? Why? Gravity definitely brings things together. If you had the Earth and the moon sitting out there in space and you just let them go, and maybe Chad will mock this up in, uh, in Universe Sandbox, uh, they will just drift together and smash into each other. So clearly that's not what the moon is doing. And this is the discovery that Isaac Newton made when he looked up at the moon. He said, well, here's this thing. It's a rock in the sky, and yet it is not smashing into the earth. And that's because it is falling. It is constantly falling around the earth. It is in orbit. And so all orbits are this perfect balance where they are going around some other object of mass and they go around and around and around and the object the orbit can be very circular and the the orbit can be very elliptical but at the end of the day these things are are stable and allow an object to move without changing its um, like changing its orbit over very long periods of time. Now, you move a little faster at one part of your orbit and slower than another part of your orbit. But anyway, so, so the question then is, like, how is the moon drifting away from the Earth? And the reason is because the moon is affecting the Earth with its gravity. The moon is pulling on the Earth with its gravity, and it's actually squeezing the Earth a little bit. And the Earth gets these handles on the sides of it. And then the moon's gravity is trying to slow down the rotation rate of the Earth. Now, when you think about the sort of the total amount of velocity in the system between the Earth and the moon, um, then over time, as the Earth's rotation slows down, the orbit of the moon has to compensate for this to happen. And so the moon will drift out outward. And over time, the, the Earth's rotation will continue to slow down until eventually the Earth and the Moon are locked together. The same face of the Earth always faces the Moon, the same face of the Moon always faces the Earth, and they're locked together forever. And then at that point, the Moon will no longer change its distance. And you can have another situation where if the, if the Moon is orbiting faster than the length of day on the planet, and the example of this is Mars, Phobos takes, I think, 14 hours to go around Mars, and a day on, on Mars is about 24 hours. And so, because Phobos is actually going faster than a day, it's actually speeding up 
Mars's orbit, you know, grabbing onto those handles. And by doing so, to compensate, Phobos is actually spiraling inward on Mars. And over the next 50 million years or so, Phobos will actually crash into Mars because this happens. So wherever you've got two objects orbiting each other and they're not perfectly locked to each other, then they'll be changing in their orbit ever so slightly. Vasilej Milosevic. Are there any theories of what material black holes are made of? If it's so dense in there, it must be very high on the periodic table. The short answer is that we have no idea what's inside a black hole, what's inside the event horizon of a black hole, right? We kind of understand what a neutron star is, uh, where the, the pressure and gravity is so strong that it's able to overcome the, the fact that protons and electrons really don't want to be near each other, and it smashes them together and turns them into neutrons, mostly in a neutron star. And that is like the limits of our understanding of what matter can do when it's incredibly compressed. Now we see black holes, so we know that there's another stage, there's something else. But the problem of course is that the escape velocity of the gravity is so strong that nothing gets out. No light gets out, no matter gets out, there's no way to see what's going on in there. And so astronomers have tried to, to calculate using their theories. And the best theories that we have for particle physics, for quantum mechanics, falls apart when you're in the environment of a black hole. And so maybe there's like a thing inside the event horizon. It's some object that is more dense than a neutron star, some future phase that that material can go into that is more dense. And it's like some rapidly rotating something. But maybe it just continues to compress forever. So it's whatever forces have stopped, you know, there's nothing to stop it from continuing to just compress and compress and compress and compress. And it just does that forever, faster and faster and faster. But all that mass is still there, compressed into this infinitely small amount of space. Astronomers refer to this as the singularity. And the reality is, is they just, right now, we have no idea. Um, anyone who figures this out gets to have a Nobel Prize. Michael Murphy, I have an idea for a SETI experiment. What if we look for special distances between stars or special star orbits? That is a great idea. And, and it is something that people have looked for. So let me explain why that's such a great idea, because it really is a great idea. The position of the stars in the, the Milky Way is not ideal for a future civilization. Stars are too far, they're in a flattened disk, right? When you think about the kinds of distance, there's a lot of really big stars that are going to die really quickly and they're going to give off all their gas and they're going to explode a supernova. So there's, you know, it is not a well-organized galaxy. And so you can imagine some future civilization saying, okay, what is the most effective and efficient way to organize all of the raw material that we have at our disposal? All of the stars, all the planets, all the black holes. What is the most efficient way? And I've seen ideas where you like have a supermassive black hole, and then you have other black holes rotating around that supermassive black hole, and then you have sort of perfectly aligned star systems r orbiting around those other black holes and then star systems and planets and you could have a million stars orbiting in one gigantic solar system and just imagine the living space that you could have and everything would be relatively close and you could communicate quickly and you could send ships around now you're thinking like how could we move stars but this is an idea that's been thought of it's called the Shkadov thruster and the gist is that you have a star right the star is giving off illumination giving off light and then you put a mirror around half of the star like a shell and so what's going to happen then is the light pressure from the star is going to push away at this shell but the gravity from the shell is going to pull at the star and so then what happens is essentially the star pushes itself around wherever you want it to go and it's very slow but over billions of years, you can move a star across the entire Milky Way. So you can imagine some incredibly advanced civilization has rearranged stars at a smaller level into some cluster or all of the stars in the entire galaxy into some shape that makes sense. And astronomers have gone looking for this kind of thing. And so far they haven't seen it. 
So, and, and weirdly, they would be easier to find because you would essentially be looking out into space, you know, the Gaia spacecraft that's currently mapping the position of 1% of the Milky Way would notice some really bizarre collections of stars in weird shapes. And so far, none of this has turned up. Entire galaxies that are in this perfect symmetrical formation, but nobody has seen them. So um, it's one great way. It's probably one of the most powerful arguments for why I personally think that we're alone in the universe. We look out into the universe and we don't see extraterrestrial civilizations at a massive scale engineering their entire galaxies, which feels like a thing that will eventually happen. So there you go. That's why we're all alone. But anyway, great question. I love thinking about that. Sharky. There's a design that constantly popped into my head while watching The Expanse and other realistic depictions of space. Has anyone tested a hybrid rotational actual gravity design where a large, instead of living on the outer wall of a rotating habitat, a conical rotating habitat is put on the moon or another body where part of the gravity comes from the local gravity and another part comes from the spin to bring the environment up to 1G? Yes! Although if you came up with this idea all on your own, congratulations, that's awesome. So the thing is called a gravity train. And the gist is that, you know, you're on Mars and you're going to have, say, 35% Earth gravity. So that's not enough to live a long and healthy life on Mars. Say, we don't know, right? So what you do instead is you set up a, a big rotating, almost like a Ferris wheel that's at an angle. And it's rotating, so it's kind of like one of those rotating habitats. But it's rotating in such a way that the, the force, the outward force, gives you the other 65%. So you've got the outward force of the rotating habitat, you've got the force of gravity from Mars, it balances out and you're experiencing 1G. And so when you think about that, right, you think about the fact that even if you're on the surface of Mars, it might be that you're still going to have to live in a rotating space station to not suffer the long-term effects of, of low gravity. And it shows why living on Mars for long periods of time is probably going to be really difficult and people won't want to do it. Imagine if people want to live on Mars, but they can only do it for a couple of years and they have to fly to space. So that's why I really feel like you know, you build these rotating space stations in space, they, you get them rotating, and there's no friction, they'll rotate forever. While on Mars, you're going to have the friction of the surface, you're going to have to keep the thing powered, keep the thing rotating, it's going to get very expensive from a power point of view. But still, it's a great idea, and it is the solution, probably, to a low gravity. AFMMK. Hey Fraser, it's a hypothetical question. Imagine we send a lander to Europa and we drill through the ice and we found real evidence for life living in the underwater sea that it has. What would be the real world implications of it here on Earth? How would everyone react to it? What would humanity do as the next step? I like your future. That sounds amazing, right? We send the Europa spacecraft, the lander, it drills through the ice, it finds evidence of life on Europa. So. Uh, and we and so we have like the best possible evidence. Maybe some kind of squid shows up and takes away one of the little hydrobots. Uh, so you've got really great evidence that there's life down there. Um, what do we do? So so the the big question that we face right now is: Are we alone in the universe? Did life form on Earth and nowhere else in the universe? And so if you found life on Europa, then the answer to that question is no, right? Um, life is on Earth. And life is on Europa, so there's life on two worlds. Now the question that you want to find out is, is the life related between the life on Earth and the life on Europa? And the only way to do that is to sample that life, to find out if it has DNA that's similar. Uh, in fact, can we find a common ancestor between us and the Europa life? What was the method? Was it some kind of asteroid that smashed into Earth and went over to Europa? Was it some asteroid that hit Europa and sent life to Earth? So if we are related, that's amazing, but it tells us, okay, we know that life exists across the solar system, but is life in other solar systems? We don't know yet. If the life formed completely independently has no connection to us here on Earth, then that means that life is everywhere. And if life is everywhere, then why don't we see it? So, uh, unfortunately, if we find life on Europa, we will get an answer to the most important question that humanity can possibly ask. And now we will have new questions that are even more important. So, uh, we'll never be bored. Yari Hakalati. It's Earth and our solar system that's bizarre. This is like blaming everyone for our shortcomings. Our system is one in 100,000. Get used to the fact. 
Yeah, what we're finding is that over time, we are discovering more and more examples of other solar systems, and we're finding that variety is, is what's going on. You know, before we had found the first solar systems, we thought that other solar systems would be very similar. You would have a bunch of terrestrial planets clo roughly close into the star, and then you'd have the gas giants, and then you'd have some ice worlds, and then you'd have a Kuiper belt. And the models have been worked up to sort of explain how this would come together. And then the first planets that were found around a sun-like star were these hot Jupiters orbiting really closely in a place that no one ever thought a planet should be able to get to. And now we're finding hot Earths next to their star, planets that are going around red dwarf stars. We're finding planets with many times the mass of Jupiter, mini Neptunes, things like that. So we're finding that the variety is out there. And the more that we discover these other solar systems, the more that astronomers have to work with to figure out the new rules, right? The patterns will emerge. And they'll be like, okay, if you've got this size of a star and, and the star has these kinds of chemicals in it and it came from this kind of a solar nebula and it's this age, then these are the kinds of planets that tend to form and they will, they'll have a more complicated model for how the different solar systems will form. And then they'll be able to make predictions and say, okay, great, here's a new star. It's probably going to have these kinds of planets around it. There's another star that's going to probably have those kinds of planets. But this is just how science works, right? You have an idea, and then as you make actual discoveries, you find things that blow your mind, and you can't wait to learn more. So, uh, so get used to that. Adult film star. Could there be aliens that look just like us but wouldn't be like us? Like they could lay eggs and have a different blood color? We've been on a Star Trek bender around the house uh, for the last couple of weeks. And isn't it weird that all the aliens just look like, look like humans, but they've got like just weird ridges on their heads. And that's how you know they're aliens. Or their fingers are kind of mushed together. Anyway, Star Trek. Um, we, of course, have no idea what aliens will look like. The only things that we have to work with is we make the assumption that aliens have to live in this universe too. So they have to obey the laws of physics, the same laws of physics and chemistry that we do, right? Gravity will pull you down. The star is in the sky. Um, you know, like there's going to be various things. And then various chemicals come together in ways that hydrogen and oxygen come together and they make water. Um, <clears throat> so you can sort of if, with that as your baseline, we don't know what the variables are, how all the different ways that life could form. But we do see here on Earth this idea of, uh, is it convergent evolution? Where essentially evolution solves the same problem multiple times, right? Like eyes. We know that eyes have evolved many times on a completely separate creature in a completely separate way because eyes are useful being able to see in your environment. Or wings, right? Bats have wings, birds have wings. Insects have wings, and they all evolve these wings in a different way. So if we saw an alien with legs, that would make sense because it would try to be supporting itself in the gravity as a way of locomotion. If we saw an, an alien with wings, that would make sense. And of course, the idea of an egg, right? Insects lay eggs, birds lay eggs, platypuses lay eggs, so um, fish lay eggs. Uh, so this idea, again, of, of you, know, you create a package that your baby is going to require to be able to survive and have and grow um, that makes sense so we still don't know what all of the nuances and all the variations are going to be and this is going to be exciting I, would, I, I mean like one of my great frustrations is that we may find life we may know that there is life there but we won't actually be able to see them up close and know how they actually function on another star system for a long time until we figure out how to actually travel there so um, but yeah we don't know Ali Saeed Imagine VR so immersive that it's indistinguishable from reality. Wouldn't true human space exploration at that point be completely obsolete? Just in androids. Yeah, I, I mean, it's bigger than that, right? In that, think about the rate of technological progress. Elon Musk is talking about the Neuralink, about being able to read your thoughts with a computer, that at some point we may merge with our computer conscious consciousness and and travel the universe so so who knows what humanity is going to look like in 10 20 50 100 200 thousand 10 thousand years from now uh, as our technology continues to grow at an accelerating pace this is the idea of the technological singularity and it's madness to try to think about 
what exists on the other side of the technological singularity. But I've heard this as one explanation for the Fermi paradox, that aliens get to a point where their virtual reality is so great that they just spend their time in virtual reality and don't bother exploring the universe because you could live, you know, imagine the planets in no man's sky. I mean, now, after all the updates, um, you know, not the, not the release, but, the, you know, it's, it's gotten a lot better. So imagine a super version of no man's sky, but all, like, you can walk around on all the planets and you can breathe on all the planets and the aliens uh, are cool on all the planets, right? Like, that would be really tempting. And I'm sure we're all going to spend a lot more time in virtual reality. And so you can imagine some alien civilization going, nah, you know, I'm just going to stay in VR. And that's why we don't see them. All right, well, those are the questions for this week. Uh, super fun, as always. Uh, wherever you are on my channel, question pops in your brain, write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. And we'll see you next week.